to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. It's a heat thing over there. Got some funny noise over there. All right, uh, but in Luke uh, chapter 20, we're now uh, uh, noting our Lord's Passion Week, uh, and uh, now we're on that Monday or Tuesday time period, as we've been noting, where he's teaching and preaching inside the uh, temple in Jerusalem after he had cleansed it by throwing out all the money changers' uh, tables and all of those who were doing commerce there, selling the sacrificial animals and making a profit. Now Jesus Christ is teaching and preaching, and uh, what we've been noting is in regard to his authority as it was being questioned. Uh, by the religious and the civilian leaders. Uh, and then also, as we are seeing now, Jesus Christ, after giving a parable, his authority continues to be resisted as they are now plotting uh, and uh, planning as to how to destroy him. And so what we're noting now in uh, uh, verses uh, 20 through 22 specifically is that the leaders of Israel had uh, selected several spies, again from the uh, Pharisees and the Herodians, again the civilian leaders that were uh, favorable to Herod, how they were plotting against Jesus to uh, uh, catch him in some falsehood or uh, some, something that would condemn him both to not only the religious people but also to the civilian people. Uh, and uh, therefore they sent out spies to entrap him who were being hypocr uh, hypocrites, putting on a facade as to who they were as righteous individuals but actually coming with evil intent. And so as we pick it up tonight in verse uh, 21, we're going to see something uh, specific in regard to their actions that we need to learn from and then understand the doctrines that are found in the scriptures that warn us about these type of people and then how not to be that ourselves as well. So let's go back into the scriptures where we go back to verse 19. It says, And the scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour, and they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. And they watched him, and here's where we uh, are picking it up, and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so as to deliver, deliver him up to the rule and authority of the governor. And again, that would be Pontius Pilate, and specifically the Roman uh, government at that point. Now in verse 21, it says, And they questioned him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their trickery and said to them, Show me a denarius whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And we'll get into that whole aspect in regard to taxation a little bit later on. Uh, not tonight, but uh, uh, in the next couple of sessions. But uh, back up in verse 21 is what I'm noting and uh, focusing on this evening. Because what we see here in regard to these hypocrite spies, again, they are also acting in self-righteous flattery towards our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that they could gain an advantage over him and then ultimately uh, you know, uh, launch their snare or trap upon him and then try to catch him in that trap or snare where he would hopefully condemn himself. Therefore, they could turn him over to the civilian government and have him destroyed. So what we're going to be focused on this evening is the flattery of these flatterers. And uh, what the Bible says about flattery and flattering and how we should not entertain that within our own walk as Christians and believers in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because all the time these flatterers are just trying to gain the advantage over those that they are flattering for some form of benefit back to themselves. Either to gain something from them, maybe their riches or their power or authority that is now favorable towards them, or, as we're seeing here, to gain the trust of this individual so that they can ultimately uh, 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 play off of that trust to have them do something that is harmful or detrimental to themselves and ultimately bring condemnation against uh, our Lord as we have here. So, again, they are trying to gain their trust or the trust of our Lord so that they can launch their deceptive trap upon Him. And what, uh, this reminds us of what Satan did to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he began his ministry, again, 
all the way back in Luke chapter 4 in verses 1 through 13, which are known as the three temptations of Satan on Jesus Christ. And as he began his ministry, as you know, he went into the wilderness and wandered in that wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And then when he was done with that wandering uh, in the wilderness, who was then famished and starved at that time, and now uh, a little bit weakened in his physical <clears throat> Uh, body and presence. Now Satan thought it was an opportune time to come and launch an attack against him, trying to get him to uh, throw off his faith in God and instead try to solve his own problems, first and foremost with his deity, and then also to placate off the authority and power that he had being God himself and certainly being the son of God as well. And in regard to those three temptations that Satan uh, tempted Jesus with, he used flattery in all three cases, trying to puff him up as to who and what he was and think that he could rely upon himself and therefore he didn't need God the Father nor God the Holy Spirit to sustain him in the weak state that he was in and the furtherance of his life here on planet earth. He wanted him to take matters into his own hands and really turn against the Father and the Holy Spirit. And in that he flattered him saying, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. And again with the first class condition lift, if and you are the Son of God. Well, uh, these pawns of Satan that we can call them, these uh, religious and civilian leaders of Jerusalem and Israel of that day, were just like their father, and ultimately, who is Satan, and ultimately utilizing that same tactic to flatter Jesus Christ and get him uh, to gain confidence in these individuals so that they can give him that tricky question that they came up with, hoping to find condemnation in his response. But let's go through each of these and kind of flush it out. Then we'll get into the aspect and doctrine of flattery uh, as we, uh, after we complete these things. So number one, the first part of their false flattery included them saying that he speaks and teaches correctly. In other words, what they're saying is, oh, we agree with everything you say. And everything that comes out of your mouth is always right and correct. And especially as we're going to see a little bit later on. And we understand that it's according to God's word. It's kind of funny that these individuals are coming up to him and saying this when they were nothing more than spies and hypocrites, as we understand, because they didn't believe a word that Jesus Christ was saying. And they didn't believe that he was the Savior, that he was the Messiah. And they weren't believing in the teachings of Jesus Christ because all of them pointed back to him being the Savior and the Messiah. So they pretended to approve uh, what he was saying and thought highly of his teaching yet they did not believe it one iota. And they weren't respecting his teaching as it was coming from him. In fact, they were questioning everything that he was saying, especially his authority, as we've been noting over the last uh, 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 several passages. So again, the first thing that they say in flattery, oh, you speak and teach correctly. Oh, we agree with everything you say. You're such a wonderful orator and a great teacher, and everything you say is absolutely correct. Oh, re is it really? You really believe that? So really what we're seeing is the lie coming from them. But the fact of the matter is, and you're going to see as we go through all three of these, everything they say is absolutely correct about who and what Jesus Christ is and how he operated and how he performed. But yet we know that they didn't believe any of it because of the intent of their heart to condemn him and to do away with him and to put on the facade of being righteous but yet being hypocrites in that facade and wanting to destroy him as we know. So they pretended to approve of his uh, speech and his thought and were flattering him about, oh, everything you say is absolutely wonderful. Then number two, they went on to say, and you're not partial to anyone. In other words, you're here to help everybody, Jew and Gentile. And in the fact of the matter is, we know that they hated the Gentile people and wanted to do away with the Gentiles, and they wanted to be the favored individuals. And so to come to Jesus and say, you're impartial to everyone, oh, you're such a wonderful individual, but yet they were criticizing his authority to act and to teach. As again, he came into the temple and cleansed it of uh, the money changers. He cleansed it of those who are making a profit and doing business in the place of worship, the house of prayer. 
Yet they were criticizing all of that, but yet they're saying, oh, you're impartial to everyone. You love everybody and you treat everybody fairly and uh, the same. And you, in other words, you operate with integrity, righteousness and justice and absolute fairness. Yet they were questioning now him now because they were all upset of because him throwing out the money changers and cleansing the temple, as it were, and then preaching and teaching these things and these parables in regard to the, uh, the evil that was found in the religious and civilian leaders' hearts and the ultimate condemnation that would come against them. So clearly they did not uh, think in the heart of their heart that he was impartial to everyone. Uh, basically, uh, they thought that he was very partial and uh, evil and one-sided. And yet they were flattering him to win him over and to get Jesus to think that he, they were on his side. And it's kind of interesting, again, I gave this to you in the notes as well, but when it says you are not uh, uh, partial to anyone, here we have a Greek idiom. And basically, it talks about, you know, uh, you don't take hold or grasp of anyone's face, okay? That's how we would say this literally, but basically it's an idiom uh, that, that means you are not, that you are not uh, partial to anyone. In other words, you're impartial and you're fair. And what's interesting also is that word uh, for, uh, you know, in the idiom that talks about the face or the countenance, it's prosopon, and that word prosopon means face, countenance countenance, presence, appearance, or a person, but also that word was used in the Greek language for being a death mask. And I found that interesting, a death mask, because again, who puts on a mask back in the ancient days? Oh, the players on the stage, the hypocrites, okay? And uh, basically, uh, this is just another interesting word that uh, Luke utilized uh, in this uh, in this narrative to point out the hypocritical aspect of these flatterers when they were coming to flatter our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in their false words and in their false way. So again, uh, another a second form of flattery that they brought up against him that, again, he's fair, righteous, and just, yet they weren't believing in his authority to do the things that he was doing and uh, uh, preaching as well. They did not believe in his authority. Then number three, it says uh, in their third attempt, but teach the way of God in truth. Again, everything you say is absolute truth, and it all comes from the Word of God. And to say that you are teaching truth means that it is aligning with what we know to be the truth called the Bible. In their case, it was just the Old Testament at that time. But basically, you teach the way of God in truth. And so... Everything that he was saying, and this is the flattery that they were giving to him, everything that you say leads people to the kingdom of heaven. Everything you say leads people to live the spiritual life unto God during their time here on planet Earth. In other words, your words bring salvation to people, your words uh, 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 for their eternal soul, your words also bring salvation to people throughout their spiritual life so they can walk inside the will and plan of God. Yet, they weren't believing in him whatsoever. They were rejecting his word. They weren't believing in his word. And they ultimately, uh, uh, as I said, rejected him and his word 100%. So to come on with this facade, everything you say is according to the word of God. And everything you say is truth. You see the hypocrisy of these flatterers here. But again, that's the danger of the flatterer. That's the evil behind the flatterer. Because typically the flatterer is somebody that is looking not to truly align with you in a righteous and whole way so that ultimately you can come together in unity. They're ultimately looking to get something from you. And in this case, trying to gain the trust of Jesus Christ so they could offer a question up to him, hoping that he would answer the question. Because remember, he just refused to answer the question of the Pharisees in regard to his authority. Remember, he refused to answer it. Then he gave a parable that gave the answer. So they were looking for Jesus Christ to hopefully give a direct 
answer to the question that they were coming up with. But again, that question was one filled with traps and snares so that they could accuse him and condemn him, not uh, by the religious order, but now by the civilian order, as it were. So Jesus actually did, as I said, emulate all three of these characteristics. It's kind of funny, as these flatterers are saying these things, they didn't believe a word that they were saying. They were just saying to appease Jesus and to try to win him over. But in fact, everything they said about him was absolutely true. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ always spoke and taught truly and correctly. Everything that Jesus Christ said was absolute truth, and it was correct in all that he said according to the word of God. You are not partial to any. Absolutely. Jesus Christ brought salvation to Jew and Gentile. He paid for the sins of the entire world, and therefore all sins of the entire world, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter what your race, your socio or economic background is, your stance in society, Jesus died for everyone and offers salvation to all members of the human race. And a relationship with him and his word is for all people, not just for one group, over another. And remember, these Pharisees and uh, uh, Herodians were all about Israel, and they wanted to throw off the Gentile peoples. They wanted to kill off the Gentile peoples, and they wanted to go forward just as a Jewish people unto God. They wanted to hold it all for themselves, and they didn't want to be impartial to anyone. So again, Jesus Christ was impartial. He was not partial to anyone and provided salvation for all of mankind. And then number three, teach the way of God in truth. Absolutely, because he is God first and foremost. And we have the word of God. It is the mind of Christ, according to Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. And so therefore, everything that Jesus Christ said was absolutely the Word of God. Being God and being the author of the Word of God, it was all according to God and it was all absolute truth. So he emulated all three of these things, just as he emulated all three of the flatteries that Satan gave him prior to the temptations uh, that he offered to him uh, to overthrow the rule and authority of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and strike out on his own as an independent uh, individual. But yet, uh, Jesus Christ did not give in to those temptations of Satan, and he was not going to give in to the temptations of these individuals either and be trapped within their snare. Again, uh, as we see in the wisdom that he brought forward, uh, he was wiser than those individuals, and he spoke absolute truth according to the word of God. So again, the way of deception was in their heart as they tried to present themselves as holy and righteous individuals who were aligned with Jesus Christ by uh, fluffing him up. And as I also say in your notes, by buttering him up, which actually is an idiom that we have for flattery within the English uh, world, but that also comes from the scriptures, as I'm going to show you in just a minute. But several verses that warn us about the flatterer, we begin in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 28. It says, A lying tongue hates those it crushes, and a flattering mouth works ruins. And that's an important point because the flatterer comes around to puff you up, you would think, and to lift you up and to uh, uh, put you in a place of high esteem. But yet all the while, as they're saying those words, they're actually trying to tear you down in some form or fashion and bring you to ruin. So again, never give over to the flatterer and have your eyes wide open when somebody starts to come and puff you up with their words and their flattery especially uh, when they're overzealous about it, okay? So be very cautious about those individuals because, again, their mouth works ruin. Then we see in Psalm chapter, 50, uh, ch uh, chapter 5, verse 9, it says, There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. And that's where these hypocrites, the Pharisees and Herodians coming as spies to Jesus Christ. It says their throat is an open grave. In other words, all the words that come out of their mouth is actually leading to death and destruction. It says they flatter with their tongue. So again, destruction, grave, death, all of that is in view. And that is the result of the flattery that they are throwing 
at you or at uh, anyone that they uh, direct their flattery towards. In Psalm 55, verse 21, it says, His speech was smoother than butter. And this is where we get the, the phrase, buttering you up, okay? And that's what flattery tries to do. It tries to butter you up. It tries to smooth you out so that you're calm and relaxed and you just receive what they have for you and you'll just do what they want you to do. You'll be an easy mark for them. So his speech was smoother than butter, but his heart was war. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. And that's what the flatterer does when they come at you, as they did with Jesus Christ. Again, they were coming with all their wonderful words to puff him up, but really they just wanted to take a dagger and drive it through his heart. And that was their intention. Uh, that was what was in the heart of their soul. That was their evil intention, even though they came with this facade of flattery speech to puff Jesus Christ up. So individuals like uh, we have here in Psalm 55, 21, who are in positions of rulership and authority, we have to be very careful to listen to the words of flattery that come from them, because as it says, yet they are drawn swords. And the flatterer, they would love to do what? Praise excessively for their own interest and their own promotion. And so really as they come to you and they want to give you uh, words of encouragement and they puff you up in that sense and put you on a pedestal, as it were, they're really just looking to gain something from you to, that benefits them. Sometimes it can be money. Sometimes it can be favor. Sometimes it can be to wield the authority that you may have so that it is favorable towards them. And again, when we look at much that is going on in politics today, we see a lot of flattering out there by individuals, but they're looking just to gain something from those that they are flattering, whether it be power or prestige, money or wealth, whatever the case may be, the flatterer is out there looking to gain an advantage over the other individual for their own self-interest and their own self promotion. So that's why we always have to be cautious as to uh, the flatterer when they come down the street of flattering towards you. And those who hold any form of leadership positions also must be very, very careful not to get sucked up in the flattery tone of the individuals that are coming at them and thinking, oh, listen to them. Oh, they think I'm great. They think I'm wonderful. Oh, they're a good person because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for you to say, oh, you're a great person. You're a great guy. You're a great girl, whatever the case may be. And because, you know, you have said these good things about me, let me now do a favor for you. And typically, that's when you've lost the battle if you go down that path of mentality, and especially if you start to break rules or laws in order to give them some kind of favor. Because truly, that's what they're looking for you to do. They're looking for you to bend and break away from the establishment of law and right and right, rightness and also righteousness. They're looking for you to bend the word of God in your soul so that you twist like a pretzel and ultimately end up doing something that you otherwise would not do so they could find some gain or favor or to win something from you or over you. And what I'll also say is, as you know, the old saying goes, misery loves company. Well, with that, we could say sinners love company. And many times people want to flatter you so that you throw off your holiness and righteousness so that you'll go down the path of sin and live in the muck and mire. We say wallow in the muck and mire just as they are wallowing in the muck and the mire. And many times people feel good about themselves when they have a fellow person living in sin along with them. But if that individual is just out there living in sin on their own, they start to feel guilty. They start to feel bad about themselves and about their uh, thoughts and their behaviors. But if they've got company and somebody else is doing it with them, 
oh, I guess I can't be that bad. Because look, they're doing it too. So again, many times the flatterer will just want you to associate with them in a certain way so that you ultimately end up in the sin that they are already living in. So again, we've got to be very careful about that. Uh, and we can't patronize them. We can't uh, uh, give them uh, uh, something that is outside the rules of engagement, or as it were, or, or, or bend the integrity within our soul. We have to operate in and holiness and righteousness at all times. And as Paul stated in Romans chapter 16, specifically in verse 18, but I'm just going to read verse 17 for you first. It says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. Basically, he's talking about what is called the Judaizers, the Jewish Christians who are coming along and saying, oh, you can't just believe in Jesus and be saved. You have to believe in Jesus and keep the law. And many of these Judaizers, uh, some of them were believers, some of them weren't believers, but they were trying to trust twist the words of the disciples away from a grace policy back into a system of works. And they were having all kinds of disruption and dissension, as it were, in regard to the early church because they were bringing in the false doctrines and the, uh, uh, the false testimonies that were counter to the word and will of God. It says in verse 18, as I've got it up on the board, for such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites and by their smooth and flattering speech they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting so again as believers in the lord and savior jesus christ we should never be naive and never put on a facade of uh, na uh, naivety and never uh, act in that kind of uh, you know i'm a dumb individual and i'm just going to go along with the crowd okay Always have the wisdom of God's word resident within your soul so that you are not deceived and you're certainly not taken advantage of by these types of individuals. Because there's a lot of people out there that want to take advantage of you and your position, your power, your prestige, or even your wealth or finances, or even your spirituality. So that you throw that off and enter into sin along with them. Again, uh, they, deceived, we, uh, they deceived you by their smooth and flattering speech because their hearts are evil. And ultimately, if we are the naive individual, the unsuspecting, again, uh, we will easily be caught in their trap and in their snare. And as we've already read and as we see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as it says in the, in the latter verses, he did what? Understood their trickery. He discerned their trickery. He knew what they were up to. And again, this wasn't the first rodeo that Jesus had been to, okay? As I showed you on Sunday, many times throughout his ministry, they were coming to him with deceptive speech and flattery, trying to win him over and then ultimately get him to do something that was self-condemning. Many times they laid a trap and a snare for him. But yet, in this case, as in those cases, he understood their trickery and would not fall into the trap. So again, we have to understand and recognize the evil of these individuals because it's all about them. He says, they're, uh, again, they're not slaves of the law, the Lord, but of their own appetite, their own wants, their own needs, their own desires, and their own lust for pleasure. That's what they're looking for. They're really not looking to puff you up and to help you along in life. But as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are to have integrity in all of our words and in all of our actions. And we should never get into this mode of operation of flattery for, uh, for gain's sake. And if we are going to flatter somebody, and again, there's a right way to flatter somebody, and you can give a good compliment to somebody. You can give somebody an at a boy or an at a girl, as it were, and give them a pat on the back. And we should celebrate accomplishes in people's lives, okay? Nothing wrong with doing that. But we should never have a facade when we're doing it, a false facade when we're doing it, and we should never have ulterior motives either. Because as soon as you have an ulterior motive to your flattery, now you've entered into sin. And what you've said in regard to the flattering 
has now become sin within your life because you're looking for a gain. You're not really not looking in integrity, honesty, righteousness, and justice to give support to an individual for a job well done. Okay, so again, as believers, always have integrity in our actions and in our de- in, in our words as well, so that whatever we say is always of truth and it is always of honesty and it's always to exhort and to encourage other individuals if we are going to give them compliments at all. And again, if you can't do it, then as your mother said, if you can't say a nice thing, don't say anything at all, okay? But in any case, if you can't do it and do it in the right way, then don't bother with the compliment. Don't think you have to get into the compliment, you know, uh, 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 a crowd mentality, as it were, okay? Don't think you have to get the best compliment in when other people are complimenting, okay? And if you can't say it from integrity within the heart of your soul in an honest way to give support to somebody, then don't say anything at all. You'll be better off and you won't enter into sin. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul also said, For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with the pretext for greed. God is is our witness okay so again they weren't there for sordid gain they weren't out there preaching and teaching the gospel and the mystery doctrines for the church age uh, to try to win people over with their flattering speech no they just came with the word of god and they taught the word of god and they weren't looking for a gain they weren't looking for the offering plate they weren't looking for anything but to win souls and to do that with honesty and integrity. But yet, uh, many people, uh, especially in our churches today, as we're going to see in uh, some of the verses and the warnings that we have uh, 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 from Scripture, from back in the day that also is in our present day, many of our churches today throughout our country and throughout the world are all about flattering and uh, puffing people up so that they can gain something from those individuals. But as Paul said, we never came with flattering speech as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. But yet, there are individuals who are in that game, and we are warned about those individuals, and especially those who are not content, as it says in Jude verse 16. Remember, there's only one chapter in Jude. And in Jude 16, it says, These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gain, uh, of gaining and advantage and again i love what it says they're grumbling or grumblers they find fault and they're really after their own lusts and so what do we see as one of the basis for those who are flatterers uh, uh, in life it's those individuals who don't have the inner peace joy happiness and contentment of god within their soul and typically the flatterer is that individual who thinks they deserve more or they want more or, you know, they have a, some kind of scheme to gain more. They may even have all the riches in the world, but yet they want more and more and more. And again, sometimes we, you know, ask the question, when is enough enough? You know, when is enough enough? You know, how much money can you have? How much things, you know, can you have in this world? When is enough enough? And it's interesting that those who don't have the word of God in their soul uh, uh, often times, and I'd say a majority or 99 percent of the time, there's never enough. And they always want more and more and more. Why? Because there's a void within their soul. And they think that the material things of this world, whether it be power or prestige or actually uh, monetary things, things and gains are going to fill that void but it all comes down to the aspect that they're really not happy within their soul and that's how you have to look at uh, uh, individuals and look at them from uh, you know a, a, a sympathetic viewpoint rather than an arrogant viewpoint of oh look at them and the riches and the things that they have out there how they flaunt them and how they this and that and how they flatter other people and basically they're just trying to <clears throat> Do what? Fill the void that is in their soul that's a lost soul, a soul that is hurting, a soul that is looking to be filled up. And the only thing that can truly fill that void in their soul is God and His Word. And with God and His Word, it does fill the soul so that you have contentment, you have peace, joy, and happiness. And you can say the words of Paul, I've learned the secret of, all, of life. I know how to get along with a little. I know how to get along with a lot. In all things, Christ has shown me the mystery. 
and he can be content in all things. In other words, he can be happy in the lows and in the highs of the material blessings of this world. But those who aren't content with the things of this world, and uh, 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 the, whether it be the material things, either having or the lack thereof, they grumble, they find fault, and really they're following after their own lusts. And they do what? They then speak arrogantly, they flatter people for the sake of gaining an advantage over them. Because they want more stuff, they want more stuff, they want more stuff, because there is no joy, peace, and happiness within their soul. So with the Word of God and with Bible doctrine in your soul and in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you should have all the contentment and peace, joy, and happiness in your soul, whether in the good times or in the bad times. Again, in all things, I know I've learned the mystery of life. And I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. And the power of the Holy Spirit with the Word of God, the mind of Jesus Christ in your soul, again, that is the strength of Him who is in you. And you can do all things with Christ who is in you. And you can be content in all situations. And therefore, you won't be a grumbler, you won't find fault, and you won't have the sinful, lustful desires that then will lead you to act that out in the sins of flattery and with an evil heart of wanting further gain. Flattery is one as of uh, what we know of the three categories of sin that we find within our lives. Remember, we first commit sin. The categories of sin are mental sins, the thoughts within your thinking. Then we have verbal sins, which is the sins that come out of your mouth. The third category are overt sins, the actions that you perform with your body. There are three categories of sin divine for us in the scriptures, mental, verbal, and o overt. And all of them have subcategories of the types of sins that we can commit in those three realms. As we look at the verbal sins, or we can also call it the sins of the tongue, flattery is one of those types of sins. And flattery is a sin of the tongue that, again, if you enter into that, needs to be confessed so that you can be cleansed and now move forward in the plan of God. And in regard to those verbal, uh, verbal sins that we can commit, remember we have things like gossiping, maligning, slandering, judging people, lying about individuals, whether it be on the streets or in the courtroom. Then we also have all the sins of deception that we can put out there. Where we're putting on a facade and uh, trying to deceive people uh, in, in some form or fashion. But we also see flattery as one of those types of sins. And in this case, the flattery is with evil intent, where ultimately you're not there to encourage or exhort somebody or, and to uh, hold them in high regard or esteem. You're really looking to gain something from them. And it could be a very small thing. But really, that little small thing that you're trying to get from somebody and then therefore have the flattery towards them as a result makes that flattery a form of sin rather than a form of holiness and righteousness. As it says in Psalm chapter 12, verse 2, it says, They speak falsehood to one another. With flattering lips and with a double heart, they speak. And again, what's a double heart? Well, you think one thing, but then you do something else. Again, you may be saying good words to somebody, but in the heart of your soul, you really don't care about that person. You don't have any sympathy or empathy for that person. And you're just saying these words because you want to gain some advantage over them. That's the double-minded man. And that's the evil-hearted man as well. And that then becomes the sinful man because not only do they have, have the evil going on within their heart that leads them to sin in the mental attitude of their soul, but now the mental attitude sin becomes a verbal sin that comes out in the opposite way where actually they may not like somebody, but yet they are flattering them, trying to gain some advantage over them. So as I said, that little bit of falsehood can be very slight within the heart of your soul. But even if it's just slight, it then becomes a sin when you start to use your flattering words to puff people up so that you can gain some advantage, whether it be a big advantage or a small advantage in that situation. In all cases, it is sin and it is evil. So to flatter, again from a definition standpoint, means to compliment excessively 
Again, over and over and over again. And many times it's very insincere. Okay? Now, when these individuals came to Jesus Christ, they were trying to put on a facade of sincerity because they were trying to act righteous and holy. So again, the play acting that they were doing, again, the Hippocrates, as we see from the Greek uh, word, hypocrite, an actor on the stage playing a part, again, they were acting sincerely. But yet, their heart was insincere because they really weren't trying to encourage Jesus in his ministry and saying, oh, we're followers of you and we believe all the words that come from you and we just want to hear more and more and more from you so that we can gain uh, in knowledge and in our relationship with you. No, they came with the facade of, we want to destroy you, we want to kill you, but we're going to say some good things about you so we can gain in your trust, and then when we have your trust, then our clothes are going to come out, and we're going to tighten the noose, and ultimately we're going to try to destroy you right then and there. So again, the flattery means to compliment excessively, often insincerely, and especially in order to win the favor of someone uh, or you know, to win the day in uh, court, as it were, but also, uh, as I have up on the board at the end there, to court somebody. In other words, try to gain their favor and bring them over to your side. Trying to gain some kind of uh, confidence in you so now they can set you up and again uh, loosen the snare uh, or set the snare to entrap you. So it is also trying to please or gratify somebody and feed their vanity. And again, uh, this uh, sometimes is uh, uh, very well played off by individuals. And there are, there are people in this world that are geniuses at this. And they know how to flatter people that just feeds the vanity in their soul. And again, vanity is a sinful thing as well, too. And so this flatterer comes along with his or her flattery trying to entice the arrogance and the vanity of the other individual's soul that comes from their sin nature. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, uh, 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 again, even in religion, uh, I remember uh, talking to a head of a church one time and, uh, you know, speaking to that individual, and they had a comment that I always found very strange and kind of scratched my head and say, hmm, okay, I don't think that's really the right way to go with this. But basically they would say, as the leader of the church, you, you know, I know what people want. And they would operate and function based on the knowledge of what, people wanted you see that's not the right way to operate that's just enticing the vanity within their soul and using the sin nature as a a, a lure for those individuals again as you run a church or you run a business or you run your household or you run your uh your, your politics or whatever it may be you should never do it with the with with the mentality in your soul of i know what people want And I'm going to dangle that in front of them so I can gain an advantage over them. And that's what it was really all about, how to gain an advantage over the people. And when it comes to a church, how to get them and keep them in the church, how to get them to give their money in the offering plate, how to, you know, uh, get them to serve or to do something for you in the church so that your church is big and expanded. Well, that happens in business, it happens in politics, it happens in society as well. And again, that's the way of the world. That's the way of Satan in the cosmic system. It's not the way of God. So again, we should never do things to try to gratify and feed someone's ego so that you can gain an advantage over them. As it says, it's, uh, uh, or as I have it up, up on the board, it's trying to persuade someone that something they want to believe is actually the case. Oh, you want to believe this? Okay, let me, uh, l- l- let me make it so. And, you know, if you think that is right, then I guess that is right. If you think it is wrong, then I guess that is wrong. And you try to develop that storyline or, you know, support whatever they think is right or whatever they think is wrong with whatever information you might have so that they feel good about their viewpoint. And hearing it come from you, then they feel good about you because you agree, supposedly, with their viewpoint. All right, and that's, again, what these individuals were trying to do with Jesus from a righteous standpoint, trying to present themselves as righteous, and we believe what you believe, Jesus, so therefore now we want to gain some kind of advantage 
over you as a result. After we win you over and have you on our side, then we can set you up, then we can tear you down. So it also means to be smooth with your speech or to form and create deceit with the mouth through your various compliments, uh, your, your, your butter that you're lathering all over them or the oil that you're lathering all over them or, or you know, whatever the words that are coming out of your mouth, whether they are real or not. And that's the point that I wanted to make, and I, I, I did make it at the beginning of this, but I want you to remember, okay? Many times the flatterer uses truth, and they'll say truthful things about you. And they'll use, you know, things that they uh, know is right about you to puff you up so that ultimately you feel good about yourself and then you'll feel good about them too. Sometimes it can be a lie, though. They can go both ways. But it's a little bit more tricky when you are going to flatter somebody with something that is not true because sooner or later they figure out, well, really, I'm not like that. Or really, I don't believe that. Or really, that's not true. And they were just shining me on. So I'm not going to believe in what they have to say. So when you can come at it with the truth, again, it, it seems to be much more effective as Satan came at it with the truth, as these individuals came at it with the truth. But yet, with the evil intention of their heart, so ultimately it became a very sinful thing uh, to God and in their lives. So when we talk about flattery, that is the act or practice of excessive, false, and syncophantic praise. And I love that word, syncophantic, okay? And uh, the, the, the sycophants. And uh, the one, uh, more recently, uh, or probably a year or two ago, I remember watching um, uh, some kind of a, a documentary on Hitler. And uh, they talked about all the people that were underneath him and all his generals and leaders that were underneath them. And all of them, they kept calling him his sycophants, his sycophants, his sycophants. They loved that word. They kept, you know, harping on that word. But that's what they were. And they kept puffing up Hitler, somebody who truly had no, you know, no uh, right being in a position of power and authority and had really nothing to offer the individuals. He had no uh, experience. He had no money. He had nothing. But the only thing he could do was put on a great personality. I mean, you look at the guy. He wasn't even good looking, okay? But he was a dynamic speaker. And they saw him as a puppet that they could puff up. And ultimately, the people underneath him kept puffing him up, puffing him up, flattering him, flattering him. And especially when he got more and more power over the years so that they would have more and more power and prestige uh, in the positions uh, that they were in. But fortunately, again, God won the day and all of that and tore them all down, and they all ultimately ended up being destroyed, uh, not only in this world, but hopefully in the world to come as well. But in any case, flattery is the act or practice of excessive, false, sycophantic praise. Again, when you are looking to gain an advantage from the individual, and basically you're like uh, you know, Pavlov's dog, you're sitting you know, uh, at their feet with your tongue hanging out, trying to lap their boots, you know, so basically you get a biscuit from them, okay? You get a little bit of crumb that falls off their table, and ultimately uh, you gain some advantage as a result. You have something that you didn't have before. So that's what flattery is. Again, the excessive practice of uh, the falsehoods uh, and the... Uh, uh, the uh, Again, the, uh, the, uh, the falsehoods of continuing to puff people up uh, in false uh, exhortation and encouragement. Then when we talk about flattering, okay, flattering is to serve, uh, to arouse others favorably by gratifying their desire for attention. And again, everybody wants some form of attention. Everybody wants to be thought highly of in life and in society. And uh, if somebody knows that you have a weakness in that area called Satan, he's actually going to bring people into your life that are going to puff you up, puff you up, puff you up, and flatter you and flatter you and flatter you to gratify that desire. And with that, once that desire is gratified in that individual, they're going to be more susceptible to give favor to those that are flattering them. So flattering, again, is uh, there to arouse really the sin nature. 
and the arrogance and the uh, ego, egotistic nature of the sin nature coming from the individual so that uh, basically, you know, their, uh, a favor is given because you or they have been puffed up. And so, again, exaggerating, uh, you know, favorable compliments about the individual, uh, even though they may be real. Sometimes they can be false, but many times they could be real. But yet they're really placating to the ego of the individual trying to gain favor. So the flatterer flatters you to keep you on the side of their argument or on their situation. And that's what these individuals were trying to do to Jesus Christ. Pretended to be righteous to gain his favor, trying to show that uh, you know, they were on his side and that he was on their side, so that ultimately when they asked him a question, that they, oh, this is just an innocent question. It's just a little question we want to know. We're just confused about this. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? We don't know. Well, as we're going to get into it, if Jesus Christ said, don't pay taxes to Caesar, they would have ratted him out to Caesar. And Pontius Pilate, and they said, here's a guy of insurrection. He says, don't pay taxes. Get away, do away with him. Kill him off. And if he said, you should pay taxes to Caesar, okay, without the way that he, he, he said it and just said, oh, yeah, you should pay taxes to Caesar. He's your governor. Oh, excuse me, he, he's the emperor. And you should pay to him because he is your ruler. Then all the Jewish people would have got all upset because, again, they hated their Roman occupiers. So he would have, they would have won the crowd, and the crowd would have destroyed Jesus if he said that. But as we said, Jesus was wiser than all of it and saw right through their sweet talk, saw through their facade, and ultimately uh, looked beyond what they were trying to ask him, knowing the intention and desires of their heart to destroy him, and then used fantastic wisdom so that everybody would be appeased. Render unto Caesar what Caesar. Hey, it came from him. Give it back to him. What's the big deal? But to God, give God what is God's. You see that coin over there? Even though God made the world, and again, everything uh, in our world, even the coins of our world, are really from God, and God owns them, okay? It's really man-made. It's a man-made piece of currency. It's a, something that is stamped that is given a false value. Again, you ever look at a dollar bill? What makes a dollar bill a dollar? Just that we all say it's a dollar. There's really nothing behind it. There used to be silver and gold behind it. Not anymore since the 80s or 70s, okay? Not anymore. There's no value behind it. Even gold. What's the value of gold? I don't know. But we make a value. We create a man-made value to it. So again, if it's a man-made thing, give it that back to man, uh, the man who made it. But to God, render unto God what is God. Give him your heart. Give him your soul. Give him your whole body. And love him as the Lord your God. So again, uh, the flatterer uses their flattery to sweet talk individuals to persuade them and to corral them so that ultimately they're ready uh, for the trap to be sprung. And when the trap is sprung, hopefully they will be caught. And that individual who flattered or the flatterer will gain an advantage as a result. So the two warnings as we wrap up this evening and then Thursday of uh, bring back some uh, more principles for you in regard to this with Scripture. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, it says, Beware of the false prophets. So again, false teachers of false doctrines. We're talking about in the church who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Again, sheep's clothing with their flattering, but yet they're ravenous wolves. Now in Galatians chapter 4, in verse 17, it says, They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. And this is, gets into the whole click uh, uh, kind of mentality where they create a situation of a flattery and a, a facade, but then they push you aside. And they oh, look at us. We're all over here. We're all doing this thing. We're part of the in crowd, and you're part of the out crowd. Oh, if you want to be in with us, then you've got to jump through some hoops. And if you jump through those hoops, then you can be part of us. But the part of us that they're trying to be is the, uh, not the right part to be in. And it's the evil and the sin and everything else that's involved. And yet... Again, they eagerly seek you. So they'll go out and they'll flatter you and they'll puff you up and they'll say this and they'll say that, trying to get you to jump through whatever hoops they want you to jump into so that you can be part of their clique or part of their crowd. 
when that really isn't the place you want to be. So again, we've got to be very careful with the flatterers because they come with deception, they come with evil. We should have our eyes wide open at the individuals that are flattering and puffing us up because they are typically looking for something to gain from us, something that we have that they want. Whether it just be the time of day or whether it be uh, our money and our power and our prestige. We would never know what they may be looking for, but we can see who they are by the excessiveness of their flattery and then their actions that follow it up when they aren't looking ultimately to exhort you and encourage you, but instead they're looking for something for themselves. All right, so uh, let's be wise of the flatterers, and then more importantly, let us not become the flatterers as believers in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so let's uh, close, and we'll see more principles on Thursday night. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for giving us wisdom and discernment through your Son, Jesus Christ, and his great examples for us, and help us to be more like your Son, and uh, let's do what Jesus would do in all situations, Father, and have wisdom and discernment, always operating in integrity, honor, peace, happiness, joy, and contentment in all that we do. So, Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask for travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, Amen.